We're coming back to the next video. This one's going to be about uh, cold ex exposure and eating for seasons, something we kind of touch up all the time. And uh, at the same time, uh, it tend to overlook when it comes to putting it to practice. Uh, maybe because majority of people will just use some kind of hormones and they can bypass everything, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but for normal people, this is, is probably fairly important. And often we, we discuss as well. So when we talk to, to people who are, how can I even say, like genetically gifted and whatnot, when they're stronger and leaner, they respond better to training. And when you actually interview them, you realize they have done all these things when they were growing up. So they have little unfair advantage. Uh, uh, there is a book uh, by Matthew Said called Bounce, where he discusses about uh, long distance runners. He was trying to find long distance runners, genetical, like DNA, whatever the, the hell you, you can pinpoint this one thing. And he couldn't find anything. He was checking them inside out until he realized that they all were living in very poor neighborhood. They ate very high carb diets and they lived probably 12 miles away from schools. So since it's age of like five, six, they were running 12 miles to school and back every day. So by age of 16, oh, you are great at long distance running, completely ignoring that they've been running for 12 years. Uh, yeah. So and, and another thing, another thing that uh, I think is elucidated, but not said in that book is also where equatorially most of these kids are they can mm -hmm. run 12 miles to and from school because the weather there year round was pretty pleasant i'm you know i'm not saying it's uh you know pleasant weather as in it wasn't 100 degrees ever or that it wasn't cold ever but the weather that was dictated by living at a lower latitude right so now you can eat a ton of carbohydrates day in and day out and utilize them correctly that will kind of lead into a little bit of what we talk about today um but again it's one of these things where your environment plays a huge role when it comes to a biological system because we are not robots we are not designed by other humans we're designed by nature nature has a way of doing a lot of work with a little bit of input just variation of where you live on the planet does a lot of work to your body and if you live poorly guess what you're going to eat you're going to eat locally to the season you're also going to be exposed to environmental stressors every single day probably most of the day um, and those environmental stressors are some of the things that we're going to talk about today in terms of how do they manufacture thyroid hormones how do they manufacture neurotransmitters how do they manufacture um sex hormones uh we talked a little bit about that uh last week in the in the blood work video uh specifically with sex hormones we'll touch on that a little bit today but we'll also kind of go a little bit deeper into uh mental health and metabolism because that's something that some a lot of people get concerned about here in these next coming three months right because we're moving from if you live in the uh, northern hemisphere most of our audience does we're moving from strong sunlight of summer into fall and into winter and a lot of people lack periodization right we talked a little bit about periodization mm -hmm. where uh things are dictated by external factors like your finances like the weather where you live etc and if you're not preparing for those your periodization is not adequate in other words if you think you're going to be doing the same thing that you were doing the last three months you're wrong um that's that's something that a lot of people struggle with as far as like uh knowing that they need to change because the environment is changing literally right like they don't have control of that you don't have control of the sun going away and most people think that they can live the same life year round that gets them in trouble. And I'll highlight some of those issues uh, today. Um, yeah, and it's, it's something any... that bodybuilders kind of already do. They have this bulking season and off season and shredding and whatever. Uh, I've, I've noticed lately it's quite popular to take two years out. And I'm like, yeah, can, can you really afford that? Uh, because you still need to go through those cycles. And it would be great if you could tap into the physiological effects of environment and seasonal changes to explain how to really maximize, uh, let's say, muscle growth, fat loss, 
overall health because we know all three are not really exactly the same you know you need to be healthy to maximize both but a lot of times what people do to achieve either fat loss or muscle gain is nowhere near healthy so it would be great if you could tap into the physio physiological effects of seasons and how it affects your body yeah absolutely we'll go ahead and get started then uh with uh hold on a second let me share this um <laughs> Speed. Screen. Screen. I think it would be good also to touch up on to how seasons affect like fat storage. Obviously, that's going to be more relevant for people who are healthy uh, because when, when you have slightly, let's say, off hormonal balance and whatnot, then, then everything changes and seasons are not going to help you that much. So first of all, that's why we started with everything from video one, understand where you're at. It's such yeah. an easy concept that people still overlook all the time and they they just stare at you like some kind of Bambi looking at the cars that drive at them and just don't understand what to do. Like, no, you need to know where you're at. You know, if you take a car to garage and if you don't know what's wrong with it, you're going to have a bill for God knows what, <laughs> you correct, know? Correct. So... Uh, so yeah, well, let's just get started. We'll go high level first and we'll deal specifically with that situation that you just mentioned as far as like uh, what, um, how some seasons influence more fat storage than others. But we'll we'll talk specifically in this first slide. Um, you can see right here, this uh, four green sections, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and histidine. These are amino acids, okay? These create the backbones for thyroid hormones, T3, T4. And some of you may have already seen this slide before in previous episodes, uh, but I'm going through it and I'm going to highlight some details that maybe you missed on the first one. Um, so there's T4, T3 production. That has to come from this amino acid or this amino acid or a combination of those two. But then you notice here, it says photosynthesis, okay? That is telling you that Photons from the sun have to interact with these amino acids to break them down and become the catalyst to turn them into everything downstream, everything to the right. Okay. So that's T3, T4, flavonoids, dopa. And then from dopa, you create melanin, dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline. These are crucially important, especially if you're somebody that's worrying about. Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's later stage in life. If you're not creating these last three here, you're going to have issues. Okay. But interestingly, uh, you know, it says photosynthesis here, right? And most people currently are going to be moving away from photosynthesis because we're moving from summer into fall and then into winter. So the sun will get weaker and weaker. So that means the sun will have less ability to break these down and move them to the right. But that's okay because this system, this system works in reverse as well. It works in reverse, starting with the one at the very top. What does it say here? It says melanin. Okay. If you have a lot of melanin, in other words, you did your job during the summer and got melanin production on your surfaces, melanin can now be sucked into your brain. There's a place in your brain called the substantia nigra, which is melanin. It is actually black in your brain. Um, that is there to be broken down into everything moving counter or clockwise in this direction. So if you have melanin on the outside, it gets transported to the inside. And when the environmental signal is correct, it gets broken down into dopamine, into adrenaline and noradrenaline, and then backwards to your thyroid hormones. What is that signal? That signal is cold. The colder you get on your melanin sheets, where are they? Your skin, everything on your exterior. The more skin senses cold, the more of it moves internally and starts to create dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and thyroid. And this is actually shown, I think uh, Huberman's even talked about, hey, cold exposure will create more dopamine temporarily. This is the mechanism. This is actually how it's doing it. If you are melanin deficient, I don't care how cold you get, you're not going to create very much dopamine. You'll create some, 
But what I'm telling you is if you didn't do your job earlier in the season over here with photosynthesis interacting with as much skin as possible to create a lot of melanin in surplus because you were making a lot of these and a lot of these and harvesting melanin. Think of melanin as the way that you're collecting sunlight to use later to do more work later um, when the sun is gone. Okay? Um, and cold exposure does that. Now, same thing over here. So if we go down one step, we go to tryptophan. Tryptophan gets turned into serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, and then melatonin, which is a neurohormone. This is the sleep side of the equation. Again, photosynthesis is involved in breaking tryptophan down in the stomach to create serotonin. What makes that happen? Actually getting sunlight on your stomach, right? If you're fully clothed all the time, right? And this happens a lot to women. Why? Because they're fully clothed all the time, literally. They rarely expose their stomachs, whereas men tend to be with their shirts off a little bit more often, especially in the summertime and stuff like that. They almost never have a problem creating serotonin and melatonin that women do. This is why, is because tryptophan has to be interacted with sunlight in the stomach because the major amount of bacteria that makes serotonin happens in the stomach. And then the serotonin gets transported to the brain through the vagus nerve. Once it's there, it can be broken down into melatonin uh, at, at high speeds from serotonin to melatonin. But serotonin also gets transported from the stomach to all of your mitochondria on your skin and all your other surfaces and creates melatonin locally to lower inflammation in the rest of the body. So sunlight and tryptophan create an anti-inflammatory effect because of a lot of local melatonin being created from the neck down. And then extra serotonin gets transported at night to your brain. And in the absence, again, so there's a trigger, right? There's a trigger. Just like over here, there's a trigger to switch from sunlight uh, manufacturing melanin to melanin manufacturing everything in reverse is cold. The signal over here is it starts in the morning. It, think of it almost like a season that's shortened down to the day. So tryptophan in the morning, lots of daylight, especially on your stomach, creates a lot of serotonin and melatonin locally. At night, when blue light stops entering your eye, then it goes uh, serotonin quickly, making melatonin and activating melatonin. And it can go backwards there. When melatonin is released, it can create more serotonin, creating a sensation of peace and well-being and, and at peace, right? At night. That's what should happen every night. And, so, and I have just so, like an anecdotal observation that I have people I work with who are telling me, hey, my knee is sore, my elbow is sore, my shoulder is sore, whatever. And, it's, and I ask them, can you go for a walk after training without your T-shirt or whatever? Spend some time in back garden or whatever for like 20 or 40 minutes. After the week, they start, they stop talking about their sore joints anymore. And yeah. they completely forget about it, that they had issues. All it took is just get a little bit tanned uh, instead of yeah, grabbing it, medications and doing all kinds of things that will work. Well, but they're not I really dealing with way, issues. Yeah, I love the way that you, you know, you get them to do it. Hey, go for a walk outside or go relax outside, right? Because that's really all you're trying to do. But in, in you know when i say it i go i need you to get outside with uh, as you know i need you to get a tan right and then they look at me weird where, whereas whereas you you're like just go outside for a walk right and without your shirt off and they go okay that's a little weird but not as weird as david <laughs> saying hey i need you to go get a tan because that's going to fix some things right mm -hmm. um this is this is the science of where where that comes from melatonin is an antioxidant it's going to create less inflammation and melatonin gets made at a high rate in your mitochondria if they're exposed to uv light because they're using serotonin and tryptophan at the mitochondrial level with sunlight input to turn over more melatonin from the neck down. It's not melatonin that's making you sleepy. It's melatonin that's acting as an anti-inflammatory. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> this does not mean take melatonin. If you do that, you disrupt the signaling at night. Okay. If you start taking melatonin at high doses, you have the potential, especially if you don't obey the law of what I just said, that's very crucial for this to happen, which is blue light at night. I will warn, there's a warning here. If you take melatonin and at night you are not blocking blue light, you risk damaging your eyes. Go back to uh, the, the eye uh, episode that we did uh, about that. And, and we also the, mentioned that in jet lag uh, episode as well. 
Yes, exactly. Right. If you're taking melatonin and you don't know what you're doing and you're not protecting your eye from blue light at night, you risk severely damaging your eye. You, specifically, your eye becomes thinner, your cornea becomes thinner, and you get uh, myopathy first. And that can lead to other things like retinal tears and stuff like that. Melatonin can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. If you're just taking a bunch of it and you don't understand that there are other parts of the mechanism that you need to take care of. Um, yeah, and what so you mean, it, it's probably like chronic use, not like once every three months and forget about right, it. Right, 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 right. Once every three months, not a big deal. But again, it, from the concept of, oh, melatonin is anti-inflammatory and I'm an older person, like 40 years old, I'm going to just start taking it every day for three months. That's a bad idea, right? Like, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> instead do what yours just said and get outside and get tan now and, and we do see that a lot of people will take all kind of things to deal with stress and do many other things which is not dealing with the cause of it it's just dealing with right. the symptom and we explained it in in previous video and videos before about like hey you, you your cortisol is always telling you something you need to deal with it in different way instead of taking drugs to suppress it and just confusing the hell out of your body. Like, hey, what's happening? Yes, absolutely. And then um, the system also works backwards, okay? Cold can induce uh, the melatonin that you've created during the day to go into serotonin, right? Mm -hmm. So again, photosynthesis starts the steps, every step on this side from the left and works its way to the right, okay? That's for summer months, if you live somewhere where there's seasons. If you live somewhere where it's summer all the time, then you know no big deal. It's always working in that direction. But for up to about six months out of the year, these all of these systems can work backwards when you're exposing yourself to the environment that you're currently in, which is short days and cold, okay? Now, there's a zone in between those, uh, specifically when you're coming with short days and the temperature hasn't gotten cold. What is that called? That's called fall. In the fall, the days are still warm. The days are still fairly warm. You're waking up and you can still kind of do pretty much everything that you were doing in the summer, but the days are shorter. Okay. Don't make no mistake about it. They are shorter and your body is registering that if you're exposing yourself to the outside. Um, and it's worse, actually, if you're not exposing yourself to the outside. Um, so this is where uh, something that we started the, the conversation with. There are seasons, right? There are times of the year where um, you will accelerate fat gain if you don't know what you're doing, okay? Fall signals a lot of things for, for mammals. It signals that winter is coming because of the shorter daylight, but the weather is still semi-warm. So it signals that there should be carbohydrates around, but the days are getting short. So if you eat a lot of carbs and the days are getting short or you're getting less sunlight exposure, what happens to every single mammal in the fall? They get fat. They get fat. That's an adaption. They get fat so that they can survive the winter. And then that is temporary insulin resistance it, insulin resistance is not a a defect insulin resistance is a mammalian adaption to survive the problem is nobody tells us these things so then you you're not proactive about inducing it you're actually proactive about making it worse which is when you lack sunlight and you eat lots of carbs and the weather the weather in other words your apartment building your house doesn't change temperature in other words, it's still semi-warm like the summer was. That's a signal that your body should store body fat. It should start becoming a little bit insulin resistant so that these carbohydrates can raise insulin a little bit more. And insulin, we all know, if insulin is higher than normal, you will store body fat. You cannot burn it. We know this, right? That's why a calorie deficit is supposed to work really well because you're you're not eating enough in a surplus to raise insulin sufficiently to do anything but because insulin gets raised by a lot of things uh, like you found out um with your your yeah, just play protein shake and people go like, yeah protein protein shake and, and and raise your anything insulin. processed will do that yeah anything processed and carbohydrates will do that so think about what we just said anything processed and carbohydrates that's basically what everybody wants to eat Right. every day and that's, that's what everyone eats every day easy is easy right. do that i'll have that and go as long as i hit my calories and uh we, we mentioned that before as well that you know there's so, such a much, massive discrepancy in calories what they put on label and what's actually inside there 
Uh, and, and it's very obvious in, in like bodybuilding, those who are very high level, they will eat the same stuff every single day. Not, they don't even need to count calories. They know exactly if I eat this and next week I eat 10% less of this, I'm going to lose body fat. But if you start messing about, I'm going to eat these calories and next week I'm going to swap these calories for completely different nutrient sources. Now you don't even know how many calories you eat because that nutritional value on a packet can be nowhere near uh, what you actually consume it. Correct. Correct. And, and again, so, so most people will hear this and it's not the first time that they've heard this information and they'll go, okay, well, I just need to pay attention more to what I eat. And then they forget what I just said. If the sunlight is getting less in your life and you continue to eat carbohydrates and your temperature stays the same, that induces insulin resistance irrelevant of what you eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking about it, yes, you should pay attention to what you're eating. You should eat non-processed foods. Uh, you should, and then here's another hack. As the fall comes, lower your carbohydrate intake, switch it from starchy carbs to more squashes and vegetables, things of that nature, and get yourself exposed to the cold. Because what did I say? Fall is a dictator that the temperature is still kind of normal, it's still kind of warm, but you have shorter days. So if your days are getting shorter, you don't have control of that, but you do have control of the temperature that your body gets exposed to. So the fall is a perfect time to start introducing cold exposure because not all, no, no mammals in nature stay insulin resistant. This is a key point, okay? They do not stay insulin resistant or else they would die in the winter, right? If they continue to put on body fat through the fall and then in the winter comes and they continue to be insulin resistant, what did I say about insulin resistance? If insulin is slightly higher than normal, you can't burn body fat. Well, we know that's not true. In the winter, that's all they do is burn their body fat stores to survive the winter. So what turns off the insulin resistance? Cold, cold does. So if you want to be preventative about the fall time frame accumulating body fat, because everybody knows, hey, I'm going to get fat. Like everybody, everybody tells me like, this is like the, 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 the time of the year where everybody tells me, oh, I gain like 10 pounds every single fall uh, into the holidays. And the reason is because of this, this detriment that I'm talking about. Everybody starts bundling up. The moment they get a little bit cold, they're like, oh, I got to wear a sweater and a turtleneck and a, and a jacket and I got to stay warm. And they crank up their heaters uh, in their houses and all of that. And I'm like, that's literally inducing this even further. Instead, what you should do is embrace the cold earlier than the season. So in other words, before the days start to get cold, you should already start getting cold yourself to turn off that mechanism because you don't really have control of uh, lighting and sunlight, but you do have control of how your skin senses temperature. Okay. So inducing cold earlier in the season about this time of year is when I start teaching my people, hey, start to start to think about bringing in your cold exposure now because we want to short circuit that system because we don't, we don't we're not mammals that need to survive uh the winter right we we have perfectly adequate homes to survive the winter so we don't need to accumulate body fat so how do we stop it from doing it we reduce carbohydrate intake shift it to more vegetables and induce cold so that we do not accumulate body fat and in fact we start inducing the opposite the colder that you get, the more the system, right? Going back to this slide right uh, right here, the more you induce cold, the more melanin gets transformed into all your neurotransmitters and T3 and T4. So it's like you're bypassing the sun and inducing it manually every time you expose yourself to cold. You're going to raise your T3. You're going to raise your metabolism. You're going to start dumping fatty acids into the system. So that is a key thing that not a lot of people talk about. Instead of focusing 100% on the food or 100% on your, on your habits around food, you also have to understand how the mechanism works. And I just explained it pretty, pretty detailed of that is a key component that a lot of people miss. And no matter what you put in your mouth, you're still going to have some level of insulin resistance if you keep yourself warm through the, the fall and the winter. Um, and then, um, is there anything that you wanted to add there? I bet a lot of people will be asking, hey, where do I get these amino acids? Where do I get phenylalanine, tryptophan, histidine? What's, what type of foods can I eat in these colder environments to 
uh, still match it? Or what do I eat throughout the summer when I'm getting my body prepared for all this? This change, uh, I, I think that's quite yeah, important. So that's a key, yes, you're you're 100 right. So the the key components, uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and histidine, those are all going to come from meat. They're going to come from actual protein. It's not going to come from vegan sources. The vegan sources will have some of these. Don't get me wrong. But you will find some of these in vegan sources. Here's the problem. The vegan sources are a slightly different variation. Each amino acid comes with uh, two variations on it. Uh, and the, the amino acid is, the you know, if it's coming from a vegan source or a vegetable source, the more sunlight interaction re is required to break it down. It's slightly tighter bound, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm not. if you're a vegan and you live near the equator, you're going to be totally fine. You're going to be totally fine. You're going to be able to get uh, these amino acids at the right amounts. And it's not about the amounts. It's about how tightly packed they are and what kind of um, hydrogen bonds they have, what kind of hydrogen, right? The any animal source is going to be easier to transform into all of these. Okay, so if you live somewhere where you don't have strong sunlight year round, you have to make it easier on the system. How do you make it easier on the system? Animal sources, animal sources, pork, beef, uh, and uh, fatty fish. Pork, beef, and, and fatty yeah. fish are going and, to and be just the today. I, I, I saw a paper, I haven't read it yet, that meat eating extends human life. So they have come full circle now, and I'm like, look, if you need, if you eat meat, you're gonna be healthier for longer. Uh, I really want to read that paper thoroughly, but we, we we do know that people who are coming from these blue zones and whatnot, they usually eat a lot of fish and all those kind of things, and that that's where the most nutrient dense products actually are you know you you can't get nowhere near as much nutrients from from a plant it's it's just very hard because we are not we are not gorillas and when you know when people compare yeah but look at these massive animals yeah gorilla eats 83 percent of his life he just eats <laughs> and it have so much time to just eat so yeah, and yeah, also... they're, spend, they're spending 90 percent of their day eating and digesting right like that's not you right like if you want to do that Okay, you're going to do that. And like I said, okay, if you're getting most of your, because don't get me wrong, this process is the same in every mammal. So the gorilla, let's just take the gorilla, for example, it's getting tyrosine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and histidine to make these. These are hormones and, and neurotransmitters that are made at different amounts, depending on the species, right? But they are getting this, make, don't make no mistake, they're getting it from their vegetable sources. But just like you said, they're spending an enormous amount of time to get enough of these in their system. And, and, where and do let's they... not forget as well that how many bugs do they eat in those plants yeah. and the leaves and as well. So it's, it's not just... Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they eat everything. They eat everything. But again, more importantly, the majority is probably coming from a vegan source. But what did I say at the beginning of this? If it's a vegan source, you need stronger sunlight to break it down into all of these. Where do the gorillas live? They don't live in freaking the Arctic. They don't live in, you know, 30th latitude and up. They live at the 20th latitude and down. So they live by default in a strong sunlight environment, which dictates how they eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. People forget that the, the, the environment is king the environment that your biology is in matters i i dare say more than what you are putting in your body because if you are disrupting that eating vegan and you live in canada you're going to have a hard time you're going to have a hard time yeah, you need to be very intelligent you need you need to make sure that you have the right advice and uh, don't don't just follow the next uh, greatest advice but actually research about how to get full amino acid profile in your meals, uh, just to make, things, make sure that you are healthy and uh, don't harm yourself. Correct. And then, and then that leads us, that vegan conversation leads us to this little slide right here. Okay. What, uh, what starts this whole cascade of sex hormones? And again, we touched on it last week, pretty, pretty in depth. We'll just brush up on it. Cortisol or not cortisol, cholesterol. Cholesterol starts this whole thing. Okay, goes to pregnenolone, pregnenolone goes to progesterone, then to DHEA. And then from there, you can see that your DHEA eventually ends up in testosterone and estrogen. And progesterone is on its own going through all of these cascades and ending up in cortisol, right? And DHEA can also end up in cortisol if it's being stolen, like we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it starts right here. You're not going to get cholesterol from vegan sources. Now, that doesn't mean your body doesn't make some cholesterol, right? Your liver is capable of doing this, but now you're using your liver to create it instead of just ingesting some of it and your liver just transforms it into uh, other molecules. So cholesterol is a key component. The other key part that's not on this slide, which I wish it was, is right here. This molecule is needed to turn into pregnenolone. That molecule is created when sunlight sulfates cholesterol, just like the other slide that I mentioned uh, with the, the amino acids that get broken down. Cholesterol has to, be, has to have a catalyst to break it apart a little bit and basically crack it, okay, so that it can transform into all these other things through hydro, uh, hydrolysis and uh, oxygenase uh, enzymes and stuff like that. And the key component there is sunlight, right? So, so how is this process affected when there is little sunlight? Exactly, right? So what ends up happening is right here. Hopefully, if you made lots of cholesterol uh, or you consumed or had plenty of cholesterol during summer months, you made lots of pregnenolone and lots of DHEA. And these two are stored. Remember, uh, it's not on here, but there's something called sex binding hormone globulin, okay? What is that doing? Like most people think that it's binding up all your testosterone. It binds up some um, and estrogen. But what it's really doing is it's binding up a whole hell of a lot of that and a whole hell of a lot of that. It's binding all sex hormones. And this is the start of your sex hormones. It binds them all up. So if you made a lot of this and a lot of this in the winter, your sex binding globulin can let go of a lot of this and it, boom, immediately it starts turning into all of these right here. But what's the catalyst for your sex hormone globulin to let it go? It's the cold. The cold is what does that. The cold is what lets these go from the manufacturing process earlier in the year. Now, I said something very important there. If you did your job during the summer, you made probably plenty of these. I'm finding lots of people don't do their job in the summer and get a lot of exposure and a lot of melanin and a lot of cholesterol sulfation. So I'm fully expecting uh, it, this, this fall to have consultations where I look at their DHEA and it's abysmal, right? It's like way, so it may be even flagged low. So it's like, holy crap. Okay, so you didn't really do this this part. So how am I going to fix that now that the sun is gone, right? Because you live in you know, Michigan or Toronto or whatever, right? And in that case, that's where knowing what you're doing pays off, right? So in that case, I would probably give them a little bit of pregnenolone, a little bit of DHEA. Do not do this without blood work because you can run into, especially if you're a female, you can run into uh, too much sex hormone problems, right? If you don't actually know that your DHEA and your pregnenolone is low, do not what just- What a, a lot of guys do now is they just jump straight to testosterone and it induces a lot of other things that- uh, might not be wanted. So just like, oh, I got low testosterone, low mood, low this, low that. You know, they don't focus on fixing what's causing it. They right. just want a shortcut. And yeah, it works. But unless you educate yourself about what you need to pay for anything you do, there's no such thing as free thing. So unless you edu educate yourself and understand that there are risks involved, uh, you, you're better off not doing anything at all. Then. <laughs> Correct, correct. And even this, right? Like, even if I get a, a person that has low DHEA, low pregnenolone, and it's September, right? So I know that they're not going to be able to sulfate very much cholesterol because the sunlight's going away. And I give them some pregnenolone and DHEA and then tell them, hey, only use this during the winter. Because in the summer, guess what happens? Just even though you had low DHEA and low pregnenolone, if you continue to use these in the summer, what is it going to back up? It's going to back up your cholesterol. So then you're going to go to the doctor and you're going to have high cholesterol and the doctor is going to give you a statin because you have high cholesterol. So now you're taking a drug that you don't actually need because you continued to take these when all you had to do is remove them and expose yourself to some sunlight to start this process like it should work, right? There are consequences even to well, well inputted medications or supplements, right? Even if you actually needed them, you have to ask yourself, what's the upstream effect if I continue to use these at the wrong times of the year and stuff like that? So what you're um, talking about uh, sounds like periodize your training, periodize your eating, periodize your supplements, periodize your daily habits according to not only your needs, but also where you live, 
let's let's say somebody who would be struggling like that and can go on holidays they probably would benefit from that more uh you know uh, but yeah understand where you're at and don't do same exact thing all year round no no you, you can't especially uh, unless you live let's say somewhere like yeah, like the equator. If, if you if you live somewhere like the equator, guess what? Now you probably can get away with doing the same thing year round because guess what? The environment doesn't change very much, right? Remember what I said earlier. Your environment dictates a whole lot more than people give it credit for. In fact, it, it, uh, I dare say it dictates about eighty percent of what you should be doing, mm -hmm. uh, almost certainly about 80% of what you should be doing when it comes to food, when it comes to lifestyle, when it comes to uh, environmental exposure, things that you need to do and that sort of stuff. But yeah, and 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 what you'll find is if you do live somewhere where it's pretty static year round, like the Southern tip of Florida, you probably don't run into these issues to begin with because even the little bit of sunlight that you might get because you live a modern life is still strong enough to create these cascades very easily, right? Stronger sun makes this happen faster. Right. That's a key concept, which is kind of what you alluded to. Hey, if you live somewhere where you're having these issues going on a holiday for a month or three weeks or whatever, um, may be extremely beneficial, especially if that holiday involves going somewhere at low latitude where the strong where the sun is incredibly strong. So now we've taken everything in account where you live, what time of the year you live, what you eat, uh, daily habits, all these kind of things, well, how they affect you and whatnot. What about uh, practical strategies for training? What uh, comes into mind? Uh, what's more optimal, let's say, in winter to summer? Is there really any necessary changes that needs to be made to, to get the most out of it? Or can you train similar all year round as long as you manipulate your nutritional strategies and maybe some daily habits? Uh, is there really any strong evidence that something needs to be changed? Uh, and uh, what what do you think of people who are living more towards equator and someone who is living in like let, yeah, let's yeah. say are all really good great right? things would so, they benefit from different training strategies through the seasons as opposed to somebody who lives where seasons don't change that much yes yeah i would say indefinitely it would and um, and so here's my thought process around that. Okay, so in the summer, right? If you're if you're doing your due diligence, I'm going to make the assumption that you're doing your due diligence of just getting some environmental exposure and getting some melanin creation on your skin. Okay, if you're doing that, melanin by itself, when sunlight hits it, creates oxygen, and the reason why it does that is it charge separates water. What that means is everybody knows that water is H H two O. So that means when it gets charge separated, you end up with two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. I, what I, does that mean? I hope everyone knows it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you charge separate water, that means you end up with free oxygen, literally, without having to breathe it. That's happening at your skin. Uh, you know who else does that? Uh, amphibians. You know where our neuro, our, our uh, photoreceptors come from? Amphibians. Amphibians are what donated melanopsin, neuropsin, uh, all of these opsins into our brains and skins uh, for these problems, for these things. And they breathe through their skin. This is one of the mechanisms that they use to breathe through their skin. They have dark spots on their body that charge, separate water so that they create oxygen at the skin level. We have that same capability. So knowing that, hey, when there's strong sunlight, you actually become better oxygenated. Your, your lungs are doing their thing year round, but your skin now adds to that, especially if you're getting melanin going. Okay. So what that means is that um, in the summer or strong sunlight environments, you can now work at higher workloads in a hypoxic environment. So that's a key thing there is going to be, hey, you can now raise your aerobic capacity and burn more body fat if you choose to do so at that time, or you can raise your aerobic capacity and work harder in a hypertrophy sense, okay? Um, and that is going to essentially help keep tissues oxygenated. So it's a time for performance is what I'm getting at. So, so, so can I just clarify, the, so some people don't misunderstand, it doesn't mean that you are more efficient in a hot gym it means you are more efficient if you either train outside in the sun or if you have been a lot outside in the sun and now you train in a gym. 
Uh, right. so, so people don't misunderstand, oh, if it's hot, it's great for me, I'm, I'm going to be more efficient. I mean, sunlight actually has to physically interact with your skin, either before or after uh, the training environment, if you're doing it indoors or if you're doing it outdoors, it's happening at the same time. And what that means is you become more oxygen efficient. Okay, So you're probably not going to be able to grow nearly as much because growing, growing anything, specifically hypertrophy, we talked about this in our training video. Hey, if you induce hypoxia, now you're sending the right signal to grow the tissue bigger, right? Hypoxia meaning low oxygen, right? It will be harder to induce hypoxia when there's strong sunlight environments, unless you, you know, do a little tricks, right? Like, hey, uh, a little bit of BFR training, a little bit of uh, no rest uh, intervals. So your training has to change if you're aiming for hypertrophy in the summer versus in the winter. In the winter, it will be easier to induce hypoxia. So hypertrophy training becomes easier then than in the summer. So th it, that's it, just it one It almost difference. sounds as Arnold trained six, seven hours a day and he grew like a mushroom because he was in California. And then Dorian Yates trained 45 minutes three times a week, but he was in bloody Britain freezing his ass off and he grew like a mushroom as well. Correct. Right. So different environments, different training techniques, different time needed, different stimulus needed because the environment was different. Right. This is what you I, I literally just highlighted that exact concept right now. OK, if you have a lot of high sunlight environment going in, you're probably in your aiming at hypertrophy. You're probably going to have to endure longer training sessions or strategies to create hypoxia faster or if you opposite you live in the winter or it is winter where you live uh you're going to become hypoxic much easier so the training sessions don't need to be the, the stimulus doesn't need to be nearly as large right mm -hmm. um and then in reverse right if you're not a hypertrophy training person if you're uh, aiming for aerobic capacity or glycolytic capacity or things of that nature well now you got to flip the script hey my best performances for glycolytic events or aerobic events are going to happen in the summertime so that's when i peak those things and I actually train my strength uh, in the in the um, in the winter because I don't quite need uh, that much stimulus to gain strength anyway, and I'm not going to be very uh, efficient at doing a lot of high workload stuff anyway in the winter, right? Like that is a key component, right? And then if you're inducing some cold, you can kind of sidestep uh, some things when it comes to fat loss. You can basically create fat loss year round if you know what you're doing. Um, with some of the key concepts that I alluded to at the beginning, right? With cold exposure at the right times of the year versus sunlight exposure, uh, because you can manually stimulate higher amounts of T3, T4, and other neurotransmitters that can help you not eat as much food, like uh, dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline. If you have high amounts of those all the time, it's easier to adhere to a nutritional strategy, right? So again, that's, that's, those are key concepts that some bodybuilders and things that people that like to get really shredded use. They will use ex external amounts of st uh, stimulants, noradrenaline, adrenaline. What does that do? It suppresses appetite, makes it easier to adhere to, but you see what I'm saying? Like you can manually induce some of these for people that don't want to use a bunch of drugs. And even then, right, if you are using those types of drugs specifically, you have to be careful. Um, you know, you use too much noradrenaline, you're going to have heart issues. You're going to have cardiovascular problems and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah, these are all concepts with training in regards to your goal. Again, what you alluded to was beautiful. Everything needs to be periodized. If you know what you're doing, the the periodization starts to work itself out about where you are, where you live, what you're doing, what your goal is. You put those on the table. Now you can periodize correctly for all of those things. And and it's also what we talked about at the beginning that uh, you need to understand where you're at. Like a lot of people don't make a correct assessment of their starting point, and they just want to do everything. Which brings me to uh, what have you heard about the most common misconceptions, myth, and these kind of things when it comes to cold exposure and eating for seasons and things like that. Let's say the most common will be, hey, if I do cold exposure, my muscles aren't going to grow because it dampens all kind of things and no it's not good for you uh and my, i always tell them okay if, if that was the case all russians should be very weak because when i was growing up i didn't even have warm water like i had to wash in cold water once a week i had warm water that was about it but you didn't go around stinky <laughs> or smelling like you know what i mean and uh within three years of just lifting some weights i was strongest in my country by a mile yeah. so uh what, what about that? What can you say about that? Yeah, so it, it, 
let's put it this way. You have to be smart about what you're doing, right? Okay, so you get done with a training session and then you do a bunch of cold exposure. Is that going to dampen growth factors? Absolutely. Did I tell you that you needed to do your cold exposure right after your training? No, I didn't. I said environmental cold exposure is something that you do as a stimulus to start or end your day, right? Now, if you think about it that way, okay, I'm starting my day from a low inflammatory state because I took a cold shower or a cold tub or whatever. And then later I'm going to train. That's actually going to make the training environment even more potent. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can try hard coming from, yeah, exactly. Well, even then, you won't even have to train as hard because your baseline is lower than it normally is because you started your day with a cold exposure that lowered inflammatory markers, mm -hmm. right? So let's say you didn't recover very well over the over the night. You wake up, you do some cold exposure. That will temporarily lower all inflammatory markers and all the enzymes related with that. And then three hours later or whatever, sometime mid-morning or or even like an hour later, right? Uh, you you go to the gym and you do, you start your training session. The baseline is here and just a small training effect will create a higher than normal baseline of those inflammatory markers that you want to create hypertrophy and the adaptions. In other words, you're making it easier on yourself if you do the cold exposure correctly. So that is the that is a great myth because a lot of people are like, oh, I can't do cold exposure because it's going to ruin my gains or whatever, right? I'm like, well, how are you doing it? Because that matters. That matters a lot. What, what, when do you do it? Do you do it immediately after? Well, that's probably not very good. Do you do it right before? Ah, that, that's actually, that actually might be beneficial. I just described a, a reason why it would be. Um, and then doing cold exposure, let's say in the evening, right? So say you trained anytime during the day and you do your cold exposure in the evening. Well, that's even more beneficial because that's the whole point of the evening is to reduce inflam inflammation and recover from the stimulus that you put in play, right? So again, it's it's people are not thinking because periodization is not just week to week, month to month. It's even throughout the day, right? It's even throughout the day. <laughs> so the way where you put cold exposure does matter. It's not always detrimental for your gains. In fact, it can be beneficial for a lot of reasons, like I just highlighted, just at a high level. Right Especially there. at high-paced life that we have now, where you have so much exposure to stress of any kind. Yep, absolutely. And then as far as like myths around eating seasonally, um, it's it's not that hard if you go out of your way to just eat whole foods, right? Eat whole foods. And then a lot, a lot of the things that I get is like, Hey, how do I know what to eat uh, seasonally? Cause I don't, you know, if I go to the grocery store, it's the same stuff year round. I'm like, well, just call your farmer's market up. Like just go to the farmer's market on a weekend somewhere locally and just ask, you know, once a month, go to the farmer's market, buy some of the stuff that's there and ask them, hey, what's growing seasonally right now? And most farmers will literally tell you, oh, well, this month and next month, these things are all going to be in season. In a month or two, these other things are going to be in season. And immediately you have a blueprint that tells you what you should be shopping for. It's and, not and in winter, you probably will have access to like fermented foods and a lot of meats and all those kind of things. Yes, yes, absolutely. In the winter, it's actually very simple animal sources for your fats and proteins and fermented foods and vegetables root vegetables will keep during the winter that's a staple that's happened generationally right uh think tubers of any kind right and fermented foods of any kind uh, and then meat sources right like basically any meat source that you can think of eggs things of that nature things that aren't going to be on the menu um probably pea protein and <laughs> and and rice protein and things of that nature. Those are not things that are conducive if you live in a winter environment because you're sending the wrong signals for your body to be even to be able to break them down, like I alluded to in the amino acid slide earlier in this in this podcast. Yeah, and it's uh, something that people need to experiment with. And like I said, unless you are already healthy, you're probably not going to get the most out of it. So understand where you're at, do your goddamn blood test, you know, check yourself, understand where you're at, where you where you want to move forward, understand where your hormones at. Hey, low testosterone doesn't mean you need to start jumping on TRTs and whatnot. Understand what maybe something there is along the lines that needs to be fixed and, and that's going to be uh, improving your mood, your recover, uh, ability to recover, uh, cognitive function and, and whatnot. And uh, I think the biggest takeaway would be that uh, we have 
develop these things, adaptation to cold and different foods and whatnot, over thousands of years. We only live the way we live now for the last couple of hundreds of years. And this yeah, is also that, it, this is also the period where people get sick very easily. Uh, the, it, it might be coincidence, but maybe it's just strong correlations that we need to stop living like uh, caged birds, so to speak. And start living the way we have let our body to adapt and be at its strongest for way longer than what we practice now. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's probably the best way to end that 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 whole thing. Like at the high level, that's what that's what all of this means. Awesome, David. Thanks for your time as usual. And uh I'll speak to you in the next video. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>